So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so those, for those who are joining us today um, for the first session, uh, welcome to the UCSF Global Child Health Lecture Series. Uh, we're really honored today to have um, two speakers with us who um, I think both of you are in Malawi right now joining us. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for staying up late to talk to us. Really appreciate you doing this in your evening time. Um, so Dr. Amelia Connolly is um, a doctor and an MPA. She's also a pediatrician and public health professional. She's working as the chief health systems policy advisor um, to the Ministry of Health in Malawi. She's also adjunct faculty in the hospital medicine at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Uh, and she was one of the inaugural members of the UCSF HEAL Fellowship. So for those who attended Robin's talk, um, this is the fellow, this uh, Amelia was in the very first year of that HEAL Fellowship. And she's currently, and you'll have to pronounce this for me, for the medical center where you work. Can you say it for me? Oh, maybe Abwenzi Pazo Amoyo. Is it Partners in Health? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and uh, her residency was um, at Jefferson University Hospital in Delaware. And she received her MPH from Berkeley here in the Bay Area and her medical degree um, from the Rowan University School of Osteopathic Medicine. And she's currently working on her doctors in public health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And then we also have joining us today, um, Chisomo Deborah Kendoe, um, who is a nurse in health service management and also has an MPH. Uh, she's a state registered nurse with extensive experience over 25 years in healthcare with a focus in pediatrics. And she has a master's in public health and currently working on a pediatric development clinic as a nurse mentor in Malawi. We're um, super excited to have you guys. It's always one of our um, favorite talks. So with that, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Teresa. Um, and it's lovely um, to be here again for the UCSF um, Global Health Talk. So thank you again. Let me just get our slides up. Make sure that... And then let's go into presentation. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, that looks good. Great. I will just apologize uh, in advance in case this happens, but the bandwidth has been pretty slow um, over the last few days. Um, I think we're both trying to use our phones um, for hotspotting, but please, um, if we're breaking up, please just shout it out um, so that we know. Um, I will just give a short introduction to the talk and then I'll let um, Jisomo come in as well, but thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Uh, today, we wanted to talk to you um, about a patient-centered child health approach um, that we are currently working on in Malawi, and also how this can link directly to policy work um, in thinking about how we move from vertical, more siloed programs um, to a horizontal health system and program and really looking at more of this integrative approach to make sure that we're taking care of the entire patient um, and really making sure that they have the services that they need. So um, I'll just go to the, the next slide, but I think in addition um, to the lovely introduction, um, I just wanted to you know, offer a little bit of background for, for Partners in Health in Malawi, but we do um, a lot of implementation in a small Southwestern district um, called Neno District that you'll hear us say quite a bit um, in the presentation um, within Malawi. And then also Partners in Health has a, a national presence, um, both at a policy and sort of partnerships level and also in implementation in some districts in specific um, areas. So just so you can kind of understand uh, that piece as we jump into the presentation. Um, but I'll let Chisomo come in. If there's anything else that you'd like to add to your introduction. No, it's all, it's it's good. It's good. Let's continue. Great. All right. So I will go through the first part um, of the presentation and sort of just give you a landscape of the policy and sort of Malawi. And then Chisoma is going to come in and do a bit of a deep dive on our pediatric uh, development clinic. And then we'll close it out together. So I think most of you are probably aware of Partners in Health and, and the organization, but I just wanted to provide a little bit of introduction 
and follow up. It was developed um, through and you know a health equity and social justice and liberation theology movement in Haiti in the early 80s. And there was three main co-founders. Co I'd say the one that is probably the most recognized for his prolific writing and um, anthropologic work is Paul Farmer. Unfortunately, he passed away um, just about a year and a half ago. And I think we draw most of our values from a lot of his writing um, and how he thought about medicine and healthcare and that really we need to treat everyone as we would want our own families to be treated in terms of medical care and that any advance in the science or the medical community should also be open to all humans on the planet, no matter where you live or how much money you make. So I think that this really helps ground, you know, our, our presentation and where we're coming from, both from a policy level and also from on the ground implementation and taking care of the kids in the pediatric development clinic. Sort of from that, uh, Partners in Health has a theory of change that's really rooted in clinical service delivery. It's the expectation that we don't just stick with the status quo, but how do we deliver high quality services um, that are very accessible and that provide each patient um, with this right to care. Again, um, hoping to catch the most vulnerable in those situations. And one of that is working in uh, Neno District in Malawi. It's the last district um, that, that does not have a tarmac road um, to it and it can be very hard to reach. And even within the district, there's very remote areas uh, where patients lack a lot of access to health services. So we're there to really help um, strengthen the healthcare service delivery through the Ministry of Health and strengthening their systems and programs and innovating where we see opportunities with the Ministry of Health uh, to improve that care. The second part is training with investing in ongoing you know, clinical uh, training and opportunities, both in you know, a day-to-day -day professional sense and also in more formal academic training such as we have quite a few um, programs to sort of increase the level of training of providers and have them come back to the district so we can help increase the level of care. And then the next two are sort of more on a policy and partnerships level. The first one being influencing. So anything that's done you know, through clinical service delivery, training, education, we can use to advocate for national and global policies that hopefully can vulner, you know, prioritize the most vulnerable through the evidence-based results. And then of course, the ultimate would be replication. So taking some of the programs and services like the pediatric clinic and using them as a model with, you know, of course, needing to change them for the setting that they're in, but ensuring that this same type of care can be given uh, to patients across Malawi and, and other places. And even the PDC itself came first, and Chisoma will mention this, came first from Rwanda um, and through the government and partners in health in Rwanda, and we were able to take it on and make adjustments so it fit within Malawi. I think men, hopefully many of you have heard of Malawi before, um, but it's sort of hugged by Mozambique um, and bordered by Zambia and Tanzania as well and has just about 20 million people. Most of the population is under 25 years old. You can see that um, in the 65%, and most of the population lives in very rural areas as substance farmers. There's, um, especially in rural, rural areas like Neno, there's a lack of transport, electricity, very difficult to access services. Within that sense, um, Malawi has had a stagnated uh, budget for the last several years for the entire government, but healthcare gets about 9% of that budget, which is about, uh, I think is like what, 275 million USD. And so most of the healthcare system is supported by donors. You can see here that about 55% on average over the last three years has been supported by donors. And because of that money often goes outside the government system, it often goes to other implementing partners. And there's 264 of those partners within Malawi that are helping provide healthcare, partners in health being one of them for full disclosure. 
And because of the funding coming from different donors, often they want to require strategic plans with key performance indicators and measurements of how the money is being used in the attribution back to the donor. So this has increased the number of strategic plans as well. Now there's about 56 um, and they're mostly tagged to vertical disease systems like HIV or malaria, uh, TB. So with this sort of environment, you often can have misaligned priorities, money is not flowing through the government, um, and there can be a lot of duplication and fragmentation. So within that environment, uh, the government set out to make its third health sector strategic plan. It's about the fifth policy in the sense of making a plan for the entire sector, but the third that's called the health sector strategic plan. And this was launched in January of 2023 and is running through 2030 uh, with a mission to really provide the strategic leadership and governance of the healthcare system by the government and to provide quality, accessible, and efficient health services. So within that, one of the main themes um, and running tagline, I would say, is called One Plan, One Budget, One Report. It's a uh, framework that's been used in several other countries uh, within Africa and other low and middle income countries uh, to really try to pull together um, the donor support and the government input to healthcare systems and make sure that there's increased coordination, there's increased planning together, budgeting together, and of course the evaluation and reporting. So you can see here, these are some of the pillars um, from the WHO that were used in the framework. And that is to make sure that these things are planned for and budgeted together so that there's not separate systems that are being budgeted for service delivery, for infrastructure, and what happens is those end up being separated from each other. So the idea about the planning is to really be able to bring these um, services together, to plan together. So if you have one type of service, then you ensure that that. And then also make sure that all of the funding streams um, directly guide that planning. And then of course, having uh, reporting that anyone in the healthcare sector um, can, can look at and help guide improvements um, or changes in how the system is delivered. I think this is also, I'll just say as a caveat, you know, not original to a system that has a lot of donor funding. I think that this type of fragmentation or duplication can happen in a lot of places. And I actually see it often in my clinical work in the United States. So it's just something that I think is important to be thinking about you know, within uh, the healthcare system as well. And how can we make sure that you know, services are planned together, uh, budgeted together and implemented together. So the next slide really is showing that, you know, one of the reforms around this one plan, one budget is thinking through um, how do we adjust for health service delivery reform. This is something that we have thought quite a bit about in Neno District and work with the local Ministry of Health. But still within Malawi, there's a lot of vertical disease implementation. For example, HIV, tuberculosis. Yeah, no worries. If from a if from a bandwidth perspective you want to leave your camera off, that's totally fine. I think I might do that to see if I can try. I'm sorry, everyone. I do apologize. We're glad you're back. All right. Did you lose me a lot more before my computer lost me? <laughs> No, it Did dropped off like slide? all of a sudden. Yeah, we saw this slide, okay. yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I think I was just talking about, um, you know, currently there's these sort of vertical disease silos where HIV, TB, malaria, you know, even uh, maternal, neonatal and child health, the MNCH, um, can have their own supply chain system, their own equipment, their own uh, supervision, their own staffing even. Um, which has proved to be very effective. Uh, Malawi has made tremendous gains in the HIV treatment and care, but at the same time, it then leaves some other 
types of uh, disease conditions like NCDs and, and some child's health uh, lacking in that same, they're not benefiting from those supply chain systems or the robust uh, training or, or uh, human resources. So the idea here would also be to shift from this sort of vertical disease implementation, which leads to a lot of duplication and fragmentation to more of what we're calling a platform of care or a more horizontal looking system so that you're looking at the facility level. So if you're looking at a primary facility, you know, similar to a clinic, uh, that the screening for disease is put together. So as someone walks into the facility, you know, they can be screened for, if they need an HIV test, they can be screened for malaria, other infectious diseases, but can also be screened for NCDs like hypertension or diabetes, and that it's all sort of put together. So it's really centered on the patient and what the facility can provide instead of having to go to different people and different rooms uh, for these same, same type of services. And then the similar sort of thought process through diagnosis and treatment and patient support and even prevention and dialogue. So the idea here is to improve the efficiency, quality, and availability of services, and also be able to capitalize on sharing, staffing, the space, the infrastructure, equipment, medications, and systems. So when you're planning, you're not just planning for, you know, a full blood count or a CBC that's only for HIV patients but you're planning for all types of patients who would need that kind of blood test um, so that you make sure that you have enough of that service to provide to them so that you're consistently providing that level of care. So we're really looking at this um, reform to hopefully help coordinate inputs, like I've mentioned a few times, also help with implementation planning. So instead of planning through the vertical disease programs, um, which really trickles down to district level uh, where there's specific coordinators from the healthcare team that are for specific diseases like HIV or malaria. You change that to facility-based planning and um, that's looking at what is needed for the burden of disease um, for that facility and how can we ensure the inputs uh, to provide that patient care. Also then being able to define the specific services um, from that planning, and then also be able to add in quality of standards of care, facility, and service performance um, through that acknowledgement of the specific services that provided at service level. This also allows for integration of service delivery and implementation and evaluation. So what services are best to be put together um, for the patient? Oftentimes um, in Malawi, unfortunately, what could happen is because there's a different person who does malnutrition uh, versus tuberculosis. If you have TB and malnutrition, you may need to see two different people and you may need, even need to come on two different clinic days. So it can be quite burdensome to a patient, especially if they are sick and especially if they live far away from the health facility. Um, and often that takes away an entire day of their productivity, right? So if they're farming or they have a, a job, um, so this is can be really significant on the patient and really decrease access. So how can we start thinking about what services also need to be put together for the patient so they can access them at one time in one place? So that sort of leads to how do you start thinking about these integration approaches? And it's something that we've done quite a bit of thinking around and you'll see it in the example of the pediatric development clinic in Benno. Um, but I think that Sometimes integration can be very difficult to define, uh, and there's many different ways to look at it. So there is considerable evidence, though, out there. We did um, publish an economic evaluation and also client outcome evaluations of combining non-communicable disease and HIV. So really leveraging the systems in HIV that exist, including the staffing, you know, the supply chain, the space, and adding on the non-communicable disease patients, those with high blood pressure, you know, diabetes, asthma, mental health, and so that they could use the same resources. Of course, they needed to, you know, we needed to add some like staffing to be able to see all of the patients, but at least that uh, this made an easier model of bringing those two things together for all the patients to be seen. And we showed that for 
not a significant, you know, not a huge increase in costs. We were able to maintain the outcomes for HIV and also improve the outcomes for the non-communicable disease clients. There's been a lot of mixed methods um, analysis around this as well. And through COVID, you can imagine there was a lot of um, output of research because they were trying to keep people out of health facilities. So how could you manage to get all the services someone needed um, at one time? And there's been several other um, pieces of it, but it can, continues to be sort of an, an elusive concept, you know, of what integration is. And one thing that we really have to take into account is the economies of scale. You can't expect, um, you know, one blood count machine to be functioning for, you know, 100,000 people. So how do you also increase the number of staff or of equipment or space for the amount of people that you're bringing together in terms of this integration or the number of services? And then also the economies of scope you can't imagine, you know, that one type of provider could uh, take care of, you know, every single type of patient that's going to step into the health facility. So how do you also layer on um, some of these services in the right way uh, that, that providers can make sure they have the training and skills? So in Neno, we've really tried to look at this through sort of a continuum of care from home to the community and primary and secondary. This is what exists at district level. Just to be clear, there is a tertiary, you know, high level facilities within Malawi, just not within Nano District. And from the home, really trying to support linkage of care um, from screening by community health workers to linking to them to the community and to the primary care. Also, a lot of community education and screening within the community. And then NCDs, the NCDs and the HIV, and then now also the pediatric development clinic, and then further specialized care at the secondary or district hospital, which also includes a special care nursery, which is really important for the next piece um, that Chisomo is going to take over development clinic. So I'll turn it over to you, Chisomo, and hopefully my internet will stay stable. Thank you, Dr. Amy. Uh, hi, everyone. I didn't get to show my face, so I just decided that you should see me first before I make, start making the presentation. I uh, may at some point switch off my video so that I <laughs> yeah, get my band on. Um, yeah, I am Tisomo, as you have may have heard. I'm actually the mentor, nurse mentor in the pediatric clinic, clin uh, development clinic. Um, let me just switch off the video so that I, yeah, okay. Yeah, so basically we, I just wanted to give you one scenario, one case that we actually had and um, uh, yeah, the, the child actually came out well. It was a child who was born with um, very poor apical score, severe birth asphyxia. And this child was born to a teenage mother. She was 17 years old, her first pregnancy. And this child stayed uh, in the neonatal intensive care unit for two, two weeks on oxygen and was fed uh, through the NGT. Uh, had, was given phenobaptin because the child had seizures on and off while in the neonatal intensive care unit. After a month later, this child was discharged and was enrolled actually um, in the PDC. That's when we started, we, we took over from um, after the child was discharged from the uh, NITKI unit. And from there, even though the child was discharged, still had challenges in breastfeeding, the child could not breastfeed, had to be fed through expressed uh, breast milk, then was monitored through follow-ups with the community health workers, which I think Dr. Emmy has presented on. So we follow the child every month until on the third month when we do what we call a development assessment according to a tool that was developed in Malawi. We did the assessment, the child showed some uh, developmental delay, especially in the domain of gross motor. So we referred the child to physiotherapy where they helped uh, with some neck strengthening exercises. So, well, 
fine in, enough. At six months, the child had picked up on most of the developmental milestones, was able to sit and had shown signs of starting to crawl. At nine months, the child was crawling and standing with uh, support while holding on any furniture around. And amazingly, at 12 months, the child could walk. So that is one of the, I can say, a success case that was actually uh, seen in the PDC when we first started. This child was born actually last year. And this year, the child has been discharged back into the community under the care of family and community health workers. Next slide, please. Next slide. <laughs> Sorry, I am uh, trying. Just give um, me one okay. minute. There we it's go. Okay. okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, um, the developmental, the pediatric developmental clinic was one of the projects that was initiated, it was started in 2021. Um, the goal was to support actually all vulnerable or at risk children from birth to under five. Those that we see that are at risk of developing developmental delays and any other issues that may affect their uh, developmental abilities. And also looking at how they can be integrated in, back into the community. In Malawi, mostly children with developmental delays are outcast or mostly they're uh, stigmatized or segregated from their fellow children. So the goal of PTC was to look at these children. How can we integrate them back into the community and also ensure that their social and developmental health is not much affected, even the, not only the child as an individual, but the parent as well. So basically it's a threefold ministry, we would call it like that, because we have the medical component, we have the developmental component and the nutritional con component that um, is integrated to look at the lives of those children. So we are servicing them uh, to ensure that they are healthy, physically, cognitive, social, and emotionally, they develop to their capacity. Even though it may take time, but within that process of taking time, it would help them to develop well. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, from this slide, you can actually see that we have four conditions that mostly affect neonates, um, asphyxia, preterm, low birth weight, and uh, sepsis. Mostly we know that any child below 2,500 grams is considered low birth weight. So this is one of the proposing reason for the development of the PDC. Why is because we had children who had asphyxia. How do they, uh, develop? How do they manage? How do they uh, move on after they are discharged from the hospital and they are born with, with asphyxia? How are children managed and how are they once they are born with low birth weight or they had a preterm birth? So both, basically this was what one of the motivating factors to come up with the PDC in Neno specifically. And also this graph was also part of a way of helping us to understand how effective our maternal and child health services are, and also help how do we modify to ensure that we don't have an increase in the numbers of those being born with asphyxia, those that are born preterm, or anything that is affecting the newborn that may affect them in, in the wrong line. So, and also it was one of the ways of helping the services, especially when we're working with the government, how do they amplify the services in maternal and child? No mother wants to lose a child. No mother wants to go home with a child that has uh, an issue. So this graph was one of the proposals and inspiration into the development of the PDC. Next slide, next slide Dr. Amy. Yes, so the PDC was started in 2021. Um, it wasn't really revamped by then because people had always thought children who are affected can just remain in the community and grow like that. So when we started it, it did not enroll a lot of children, but with time, it took off and it really took off very well. As we had, as Dr. Amy had said, we were taking a 
a picture of what Rwanda was doing. But the only challenge we had in Malawi is that we had to share a space in the integrated chronic care clinic where they have uh, HIV, they have uh, uh, hypertension, diabetes, heart conditions, kidney. So we were integrated into that facility. So we had to share a space uh, with them. But despite sharing a space with them, we had the access of using uh, those facilities. And we, in the process of developing the PDC, we were able to uh, have linkages with the facilities and other, uh, other places where children were being supported, where we would get the referrals from. We couldn't just start, be a standalone. We had to find a source. So our source was the nursery, the pediatric, and uh, the nutrition. Nu nu the NRIU, Nutrition Rehabilitation Unit. And then we had to put a, a process in place. We were actually following the process that was already there in the, IC, in the IC3 clinic because they do screening. They screen all the patients that are seen, whether it's nutrition, whether it's for TB, HIV. And for us, we had to integrate ourselves in, into that. We had to look at the vital signs of our children. We had to do the developmental assessments of all these children that were being enrolled into our clinic. And then we also had to integrate ourselves into that because we needed to do the general counseling and parent education. Remember I had said, children with disabilities are considered, are stigmatized most of the times in Malawi. So you find that mothers do not want to seek care. So we had to look at the component of general counseling. We had to also do um, the, re the clinical review and specific counseling. Um, though they may have be children with disabilities, but they need specific counseling with their condition. They may be developmental, they may be preterm, but they need specific counseling. And the clinical review would always depend on what the child uh, is suffering from. It's The child may be healthy, doesn't need clinical review, fine. But if there are other issues that would make the child require clinical review, it would have to have that opportunity because in the IC3, one of their component is clinical review and specific counseling. And then we also use physiotherapy and uh, physical support and not forgetting the social support, which is one of the fundamentals of uh, uh, poor farmer because he felt that even you give somebody medicine without that social support, it is not uh, worth it, but you need to support them socially. So there are components of social support and we have uh, uh, depression counselors who are also there who do the psychosocial counseling. So we integrated ourselves into an already existing system. We did not create any system, but we adapted what was there and we used every component of what is already there. Uh, the next slide, please. So not every child that is referred to the PDC is actually enrolled in the program. We have to do um, the screening for admission. We have several uh, criteria that we, are, we, we usually use. Our clinic currently admits uh, children with uh, severe or mild birth asphyxia, preterm, whether it is extreme, or just per term, they are admitted, they're enrolled in the clinic, low birth weight, malnourished children, uh, those with developmental delay, those with epilepsy, those with genetic abnormalities. But the child has to be below five years. Any child about five years does not fit in the criteria. And then once they fit the criteria, they are enrolled in the program and then they are given a specific date according to the condition for their first follow up. Okay, how has the mother adapted since being seen in the clinic? How is she coping with this condition? How is she being accepted in the community? Has anything come up that is affecting her psychology, psychologically? So in the first follow-up, we look at all these things. And then after that, we do the first uh, developmental assessment. We use a tool that was developed in Malawi. It's called the Malawi Development Assessment Tool. It looks at the development uh, of the child. Is the child picking up on their developmental milestones or their problems? And then we continue uh, with the follow-up. And eventually, if the child reaches five years, we obviously would have to discharge. If the child is uh, has... Uh, picked up on the milestones, has developed no other problems, 
depending on our discharge criteria, the child is actually discharged from the program. Where do we discharge our children to? We discharge them to our under five clinic. We discharge them to the community. If the child has severe cerebral palsy, is discharged to the palliative. If the child has epilepsy and needs continuing monitoring and medication, would actually be discharged to the mental health. So there are arms where we discharge all these children. If they're five years, obviously we'd have to discharge them to whatever other facility. But if the child is below and has picked up well, obviously most of the times we'll discharge them to our under five clinic because in Malawi, children are supposed to continue under five services until they're five years. So we'll actually discharge them there until the child continues with that. So if the child does not fall within the criteria for admission in the PDC, would actually say, no, the child doesn't fit uh, the criteria for this, but would actually be sent to the right, um, to the right place for further management if they do not fit. Because sometimes people would actually think, oh, this is a PDC case, but when we look at the child has nothing to do with PDC, the child is fine, just needs medical attention or something else. Or the mother may just need some psychological support and is fine. So basically we'll follow uh, this flow chart and we, when we are working in the pediatric clinic. Uh, next slide. So how have we integrated? As I was saying, we follow the, uh, inter, in, the IC3 integrated chronic care uh, setup that was already put in place when they were in putting it up. So every child that is enrolled goes through our nutritional screening. We know that there's always an issue with malnutrition uh, in Malawi. So once we do my nutrition, uh, nutritional screening use the fact using our parameters, we usually use the weight, the height and the mid up, mid up upper arm circumference. If the child fall, falls within uh, the lower Z score, then they would have to go for new for nutritional support. So we always do the nutritional screening as a uh, uh, the, as the first thing whenever we are enrolling the child. Usually uh, if the child is less than six months, we just do weight. But if it's any child from six months above, it actually has to do, we have to do all three, the weight, the height, and the upper up, uh, the upper arm um, circumference. After that, and then we do our developmental assessment. Um, during our developmental assessment, that's when we pick up any clinical issues that the child may have. So basically in the IC3, there are three uh, clinics that are provided. There is the advanced non-communicable disease. Then there is non-communicable disease. And then we have the mental health and of course, not forgetting the palliative care. So whatever category the child fits in would actually send it there. We would send the child there and then after the review would actually come back to us and we continue with whatever management is there. If the child has failed uh, in the developmental assessment because we look at four domains, we look at the language, we look at the social, we look at the fine and the gross motor of each child. So if the child has failed, especially in the fine and the gross motor, would actually leave, refer that child to physiotherapy. And fortunate enough, we are also able to refer our children to speech therapy and occupational therapy. So would actually refer the child to um, for that therapy. And once we are done, we do not forget the psychosocial counseling because we don't want to leave the mother out, out alone while the child is receiving care. So we deal with our mothers uh, and we do psychosocial counseling. We would sometimes counsel them in groups depending on if mothers are, we have groups. The mothers with children with epilepsy, we counsel them together. The mothers with children with asphyxia, we counsel them together. So we group those mothers because we want to create partnership between mother and mother. And we want to strengthen the social, uh, the, the, the partnership even between mother and the father in the home or mother and relatives in the home because this support for the child is not an individual um, 
activity for this mother alone. She has to have social support uh, from the community. So we do psychosocial support. If we cannot counsel the mother, then we bring in the depression team, which is actually working hard um, and they, they look at the depression, the anxiety issues that the mother's concerned with, and then they would actually counsel her and then uh, we move on from there. And then lastly, we also look at the social support. We have a, uh, a, a, a support that we provide our mothers with transportation, you know, where we are residing then is very far from where they come from. So we'd actually give them some money for their transportation so that at least she can find uh, support that next time she comes back with the child. So we have been integrated. We do not work alone. So the three uh, four ministries are there. The medical is there, the developmental is there, and the nutritional component of PDC are all Im embedded in our flow chart. Uh, next slide. So when you look at this, it's uh, until our current, uh, until last month, when from the time when we started to where we stand as of uh, July, 2023. So we have enrolled quite a big number. When the project was actually started, it was, um, the initial plan was that by year three would have had uh, enrolled 300 children. But I think it took a different turn because we haven't even reached year three yet, but we are already above uh, 300. Mind you, this program, uh, this project is actually one of the kind in Malawi. Though at Queen's, uh, Queen Elizabeth, which is our tertiary hospital, it has a smaller program, but not as much as the one in Menno. So there wasn't a lot of data for Malawi that would actually like give a good picture on what uh, the numbers would be. So basically they had thought, okay, by the year, by the third year of the project would have 300 children, but unfortunately, or oh, good enough, we have passed that number in the second year. So you can see from the graph that we are actually having a lot of children that are born with asphyxia. And then that is actually followed by those that are coming out with low birth weight and then the preterm. And then we have those with departmental delay, the epileptic children, and then the genetic abnormalities. So if we dis disaggregate them by age, most of them are below 12 months because the moment a child is born, if it is having any of these challenges before being discharged back to the community, it is brought into the PDC. So basically we capture all children, whether they are born from the community, uh, actually in the health centers or in the district hospital. So that's where we capture a lot of these children. And as I had said, we refer them to different services. So you can actually see that a lot of our children are actually referred for nutritional programs because of malnutrition and physiotherapy because the aspect of uh, HIE. And also, of course, 88% of our children actually receive uh, the social support. A very few number of children are actually referred to our tertiary uh, service or any other service outside that. But basically most of that is done here in Neno. When we first started, we had a lot of children being admitted uh, in the hospital. But as the project has been continuing, I think with the support of the nutrition aspect and then the continued support from physiotherapy, we can actually see that we have come down from 67.4 to currently what we stand out at as 7.9. So the quality of care that we are providing to these children actually has supported um, the reduction in the number of children who are being admitted. And one of the good thing is that uh, previously we used to use phenobarbital for, phenobarbital for epilepsy, but then uh, partners in health came in and they stopped, started buying sodium vaporate, which we are using for our children who are under mental health. And it has shown that uh, it has reduced in the number of seizures a child actually would report when they come for follow-up visits. So this is how we are far with uh, our PDC. Uh, I think next slide, Dr. Emi. 
yes, we have opportunities, we have challenges in everything that we do, and there are some lessons that we have learned. Um, this program has the opportunity of being supported by community health worker. So the moment the child is discharged or the moment the child is enrolled in the program, the community health worker is informed in the community there's a child, can you make some follow-up? So the services does not just stop in the hospital, but the moment the child goes home, it has created that awareness that there are children, there are services that are being provided. And this is through the support of the Community Health Work Program. And it has actually helped to build a stronger uh, and better support system. Previously, it was the mother alone, but now the community is coming in to uh, support all these mothers with children who are born with some challenges. And it has also improved the case finding because the moment the community has known that there are these children who receive support, they are being sent to the hospital. Challenges currently, we don't have a pediatrician in the district, so we use whatever we can do. If it's something beyond the hospital, the doctors in the hospital would actually have to refer them to the tertiary hospital, which is Queen Elizabeth. I talked about the long distance transport tra challenges, especially during the rainy season. The road network here is very poor. Uh, we are still struggling with traditional beliefs uh, that are there in the community. We have a large number of teenage mothers who are actually in the program and really, really, you really need time to take uh, to, to, to talk to our teenagers. So it's quite hectic. And uh, we have lack of knowledge on what, what are developmental delay, disabilities, and all of that. And we also, this has contributed to a lot of default rate. And also we have limited resources because where we are operating, it's quite a small room, but we have a lot of number, uh, we have a large number of children whom we have to see every day. So in a month, we see about 100 and something children every month. So the lessons that we have learned is we have, children can gain independence uh, despite the developmental challenges. And then in the minutes of limited resources, we have seen that we are able to get good results. Limited resources, good results. So yeah, that's also one of the lessons that we have learned. And that's why we feel that this can be replicated in another setting. Uh, despite the limitation resources. Service integration, it has maximized the care. The mother comes on a single day. She's able to be seen wherever she's supposed to attend and doesn't have to come back another day for a specific service. No, service integration has maximized the care. Decentralization is paramount. We'd want to move from Neno um, to the smaller facilities that are around in Neno so that the mothers don't travel long distance. So we are thinking of, oh, how do we decentralize? How do we move from the bigger facility to there? And it has actually taught us that parental support is possible. And the data that we have gained from this, we feel, and we have seen that it can also help to uh, in guiding any policies that are there because it is quite good. And just in a small amount of time, we have seen that we have reached quite far. Yeah, so the challenges are there, but we have learned uh, some lessons from our program. Uh, next slide, Dr. Amy. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Amy. I think you can take over. Great, thank you so much, uh, Chisomo, that was lovely. I know that we're getting close to time, so I just want to briefly touch on a few quick slides, but wanna save just a few minutes at least for questions or any reflections. Um, the first slide then is really sort of taking a look at, now you've heard about the policy um, environment and landscape within Malawi. There's a real significant urge to change to more systems like the Pediatric Development Clinic? And how can we really take something like this clinic and see how we can influence other districts, even other referral tertiary hospitals to take on uh, a follow-up clinic like this, especially for infants who are at high risk or have uh, long-term conditions like epilepsy? So really approaching this from the evidence generation of making sure that we can share our data we're starting to go through a costing exercise and have many ideas for additional mixed methods, uh, evidence building so that we can bring this to show to policymakers and other clinical teams um, to show the, the outputs. 
also in thinking about coalition building um, and how do we start um, bringing together professional organizations, other um, pediatric associations, and also international donors and technical um, advisors, such as the WHO, World Health Organization, and UNICEF to align the frameworks and measurement, and really then bringing this also through working with the government directly to embed some of this technical expertise and evidence within um, the system and link them also to the coalitions so that there can be a real co-design of the program and policy and how can this be brought to other places within uh, Malawi. This is not as easy as the three box boxes might make it seem and system change is really hard. I don't wanna go through all of this slide just for the time, but I think that there's a phrase that's used commonly in the sense of, it's called relentless incrementalism. So how do you just keep taking baby steps forward? Sometimes, of course, you get pushed back, but to show how something like this can really change the life of a pediatric patient and increase their productivity, their educational attainment, and how healthy and you know quality of life that they can lead. And how can we really make sure that that value for our patients and our communities holds true as we work through you know, bringing something like the PDC um, to a policy and larger implementation level. Shizomo, do you wanna just briefly mention the next steps um, for this and we can move on to questions? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, um, we still want to expand our clinic um, because we have seen how much capacity is there and um, we don't want to limit ourselves just to Nendo and we would want to move out to other areas, as I had said in the decentralization. And also just not in Nendo as a district, but also in Malawi where our partners would, would actually continue with partnering with the Ministry of Health and other donors uh, so that they can implement the current uh, pediatric PDC package uh, nationwide. Because they are, if if in a if it just in two years we have enrolled more than three hundred and eighty six children, so I think if we it was moved to the nation, it would actually show how much uh, how many of our children out there need the such need need such support. Yeah, PDC. It's our vision that PDC moves out to the wider community of Malawi. Yeah, next slide, okay. And I think the next one should be the last. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. I think, um, you know, please hear our emails. Um, I'd love to hear any, you know, we would love to take any questions or hear reflections. Um, sorry for the limited amount of time, but please also feel free to follow up with us uh, following this as well, if you have questions or any interest. Thank you both so much. It's amazing. Um, it's And also so inspiring to see your work. And it, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, of course we need to be more efficient. And of course you should be able to be treated for malnutrition at the same time as you're being treated for TB and HIV. So thank you so much. Like this is really compelling evidence. And I think exactly what we need to be able to make the case that the horizontal approach is, is beneficial. I'll open up to questions and then just to say, we'll put a link in the chat too um, for a survey. If you don't mind just taking a few minutes, we really do value your feedback um, and letting us know uh, what you thought of the session. So I'll stop talking and let other people chime in. I had one question, if that's okay. Uh, my name's Allie. I'm a PEDS resident in Kentucky. Um, I think that this is absolutely stunningly amazing. Um, I was just curious, as you've kind of launched this program and like over the first two years and getting people enrolled, have you noticed that like interest has kind of taken off? I know you kind of mentioned just the like inherent, just like um, mothers being kind of scared to like get the care for their 
um, children because of the, you know, stigma um, with developmental delay, if that's kind of like helped with that advocacy standpoint of like getting more children involved in your program. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, actually, you know, because of the, the 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 community awareness that was created by our community health workers, I think that actually brought out a lot of mothers who were hiding uh, their children because we had mothers hiding uh, basically their children at home because of the stigma that was associated with it. So basically, I think the community awareness did a quite a good uh, chunk of the work. And we also have what we call a community program, which goes out into the facilities and they um, give messages on what programs are actually being implemented. Now, considering that PDC was quite new, people did not understand it. People did not ha understand what was actually going to happen. They housed, but with the community program that was there as they went out and did some campaign and mobilized, that is what actually brought out a huge number of women um, out from the communities. But actually they saw the results because a woman would have a child who's seizuring every day, every day despite taking the medication prescribed. But once we started them on the new uh, medication, we, women would see, oh, your child has stopped seizuring. How, how is it that you can all do this stuff? And then the actual women were campaigning for other women to come. So it was actually, it wasn't just one per party doing this, but actually a group of people in different settings bringing out these women. It was massive. Thank you. That's so amazing. Thank you. And we have a, a question, hand raised. Is it Udhaya Shankar? Yes. Hi, uh, this is Udhaya Shankar. Uh, my question is, um, you know, at the beginning of the presentation, you highlighted sort of how much of the health system is supported by uh, donor funding. And I'm curious to know how you see horizontal programming and sustainability. How do the two tie together? As we, I think, you know, we know that a lot of programming is vertical and the funding comes with those programs. But as we try to, you know, especially for HIV, achieve the 95-95 goals, how do we then transition to sustainable programming that is not dependent on foreign donors? Thank you. Thank you. And I wish that we had more than one minute <laughs> um, to talk about that, because I think that is a, a multi yeah, million dollar question alone. Um, you know, even last week in Washington, D.C., I know PEPFAR had a week long conference with many countries, including Malawi, to actually exactly talk about that question. And how do we start thinking about where we can integrate HIV care into the actual healthcare system? with maintaining the high level of quality um, that it has been able to achieve. And I speak you know, for Malawi, but I know this is also true in other countries. And so it's, you know, I think the sustainability piece when your funding, you know, when your health system is being funded at 55%, I think is a much long, longer term uh, vision. But at the same time, without pooling the money and without making it an entire system, I think it's very difficult to imagine how the Ministry of Health could sort of take it over. It can't take over these very expensive systems of, of disease-centered uh, approaches, but rather how do we start building uh, a system right now that plans together and that budgets together and we can really dig into what is health system strengthening, not from a lens of just you know HIV or just TB, but how do we strengthen the entire system? Malawi has gone um, through a really terrible cyclone this year, but also in the last three years. There's also been the worst cholera outbreak um, in about 15 years in Malawi. There's continued typhoid, and actually there's been two polio cases, one in Malawi and one in Mozambique. So just that types of shocks to the system, you can really see in the health service delivery. And so we really need to strengthen the entire system so that 
the Ministry of Health can see it as one system and can implement it while uh, domestic resources are increasing because it's just completely overwhelming and not realistic you know, for, for the public system to take over these vertically built uh, systems. So that's just the start um, of a much, much longer conversation, but it's a really great question. I think that all of us need to continue to interrogate and think about, um, and is really important as we, you know, move forward um, in this type of work. And then can I actually ask, um... For Udaya Shankar, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? I see from your name identification, your um, at CDC USA. Uh, yes, so I work in HIV prevention, uh, but my background is uh, clinical medicine, and I used to provide uh, clinical care um, in Liberia, and we did have a sort of like a, we ran a clinic very similar to the PCD model of trying to uh, provide care to children from that were graduate that were discharged from the NICU um, to follow their developmental delays. And it was always a challenge because, you know, the HIV clinic was somewhere separate. Uh, the pharmacy was somewhere else. The lab was somewhere else. So when I mother came in who maybe was HIV positive, the child also needed follow-up. It was this roundabout thing of where, and the clinic days were different. Uh, the HIV clinic days for pediatrics was different from the follow-up clinic days. So yeah, so that's my background. Thank you, that's really helpful context. and. Um... Seems like there's a lot of overlap in terms of barriers and challenges that people are facing. Any final questions? Well, with that, I just wanna say thank you to both of our speakers. Uh, this really was very inspiring and we really appreciate your time and especially given the different time zones. Um, and you guys always have the most amazing stories and beautiful slides, so thank you so much. Uh, and thanks for sharing your emails. Uh, we'll make sure that um, we can pass those on to, to other trainees who might be interested in contacting you.